What's up, podcast homies? It's really good to be with you. This interview is so fun. This is with my OBGYN, Dr. Christine Brass Jones. Let me tell you what we talk about. We talk about breastfeeding and bottle feeding, and you get a lot of her perspective because she sees so many moms like losing their minds over trying to force breastfeeding. And she's just so cool about that topic. We also talk about hemorrhaging. And in the last nine years, since I had my really severe postpartum hemorrhage, she teaches a few different tools and methods and medications they have now to stop a postpartum hemorrhage. And I thought that was fascinating. We talk about the importance of getting sleep and making sure that you're having other people take your baby so you're getting enough sleep, what she wishes insurance would cover, my meltdown in her office, and so much more. So make sure you listen towards the end for her final takeaway message to moms, postpartum, and having babies, pregnancy, delivery. It's so good. Welcome to the Postpartum Coach Podcast where we embrace our needs as moms, we learn to lead ourselves first, then our families, and where we create our own healing from the inside out to find our way to the work we were meant to do in this world. I'm your host, a fellow mom of three and a certified life coach, Lizzie Langston. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Postpartum Coach Podcast. I am here with my OBGYN, my doctor. My, I feel like she has this mother energy. I keep wanting to call her my, my mother somehow. <laughs> so Dr. Brass, Dr. Brass Jones is here with me. I'm going to introduce her in just a second. Um, but I want you guys all to know that I was planning on a home birth. That's quite a story. I was planning on a home birth. And then, um, as you know, things didn't work out. I had my placenta partially ruptured, but before that, even I had preeclampsia sneaking up. So we switched from a home birth plan to a hospital and we heard just the best things. My, my home birthing midwives highly recommended Dr. Brass Jones and her practice, which is the Center for True Harmony and Wellness. They're in, is that Gilbert Chandler? No, we're actually in Chandler, yeah. but like we're right across the street from Gilbert because like we're right across from that Costco that's right there on Country Club and Baseline. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't know what to expect. I remember my first appointment with you, Dr. Brass. I, um, you know how some doctors just, I don't know, they kind of just don't trust what you think. They just want to read what the other doctors wrote and they want to make their own conclusions. But I remember I started to kind of talk, but I wasn't talking too much because I didn't want to step on your toes. I don't know. And you were just like, oh, like you said something like, I'll shut up. I want to hear what you like. What do you think? Like, what do you think's going on? Because <laughs> my midwives and I, I remember from that moment, I was like, okay, she she believes that I actually know some stuff about my own body. Like she's willing to hear me and trust me. And that was vital. That just set things off on such a great foot. And I don't know if you remember that moment, but that was such a big deal to me because I probably was a little nervous. The last time I was working with an OB, it was a dude and it was, he was quite old. And in my opinion, he needed to retire. He was quite burnt out. (laughs) And I, um, I didn't get that vibe from you at all. You don't seem burnt out. So why don't you tell everybody uh, a little bit about you and how long you've been at it and kind of how you got into this whole world. And yeah, tell us the things. Welcome. Sure, absolutely. Um, my, uh, I'm, I'm, my name is uh, Dr. Christine Brass Jones. Purple Pixie Cut. I'm originally purple. from New York City. Uh huh. Oh, really? I didn't know. Uh, that. I did my training in Iowa, and mm-hmm. I came out to Arizona as part of my training, and in April, and I fell in love with the weather. Because I'd been in, you know, New York and New Jersey and Iowa and Ohio and all these places where the weather can be just terrible. So I knew what I wanted to do. I want to do OBGYN. And I knew that I'm going to be working really hard. I'm not going to really have a lot of time for myself. And when I have that time for myself, I really want the weather to be kind of nice. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. Outside and read a book. Or whatever. So, uh, bonus, I met my um, 
the father of my children. He's now my yeah. ex-husband. Yeah. Um, and I also met my partner that originally helped me open up my office. Oh my uh, where we kind of tried to marry uh, natural because we have a naturopathic physician and uh, you know, traditional, like give people options. We always want to give people options. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have massage therapy. We have a couple lasers coming on one that's for like hair loss, Amazing. one that's for facial stuff. And, and we're just trying to keep moving in a direction. We have midwifery now. I practice very much like a midwife before people thought I was a little kooky, but you know, it worked. So yeah. as it's working and over time, people want more of that model. And I believe that that's the best model anyway to be, to start with, you know, yes, you got to have the layers of protection. You need the OBs, you need the maternal fetal medicine doctor. You need that hierarchy, but is most people can start, you know what I mean? Like at least start. And especially if you're all working together and especially if someday mm -hmm. we're going to have actually like a, a shortage of physicians. We should all just simply be working together. Mm -hmm. So then I opened my practice. Uh, I tried working with other people, didn't really work, um, got kind of burnt out, and then opened my own office so that I could practice my own way. And I've been there for 19 years. Holy Hannah, that's impressive. And you guys, I have to tell you, her office is Hopping like all the time. It's so busy. So many mamas want to be there. Like, and they don't even mind the wait because sometimes they have to wait, right? Because that's just how it is. And well, they... yeah. sometimes you got to wait. And but sometimes you, you get in fast. And sometimes somebody bumps you because their, you know, their ultrasound might be more important than somebody else. But we've been able to, you know, incorporate some things like have in house ultrasound and yeah. lab. Yeah. Lab is really helpful, I think. Mm -hmm. Not having to run around and go get your lab over here and your lab over there. You know what I mean? So yes, I do. That's been cool too for people. Yeah. And I don't, I, what I mean by the waiting is just that I genuinely, it's funny because my first time I remember being like, okay, I've been out here a little while. And then once I experienced you, I was like, oh, I'm not going anywhere else. I don't care. I don't care how long I have to wait. And it's, I'm not, I'm making the wait sound like it's such a big deal. It's not, it was just normal wait time, but I, I just was like, oh, I see why everyone wants to be here. That's what, and, and you know what? Okay. The moment I knew that I wasn't the only one that thought a lot of your practice is my favorite nurse from the hospital that like sat me down and she knew so much about breastfeeding and she wasn't even that old. It's like, she just had a ton of experience and she had her own kids. I saw her, she's one of your patients and I saw her in your practice and I was like, Okay, if the hospital nurses want to work with this as their personal OB, you know, they want to be at this practice, then then this is, this is a place to be. <laughs> so okay. uh, I'm just real quick for my Arizona mamas, or if anybody's moving to Arizona or whatever, I love and did love and Ocotillo. It was so clean. Banner Ocotillo is in Chandler. It's actually like the third farthest from my house. Like, there's two other hospitals closer to me, but I went there because I, I got to have a little tour and it was so clean. And all of the nurses are so experienced because it's a newer hospital. They had to hire experienced people. So I just, I just love it. Okay. So let's, um, talk about me and you working together real quick. My people know my birth story. They know what happened, but just a brief recap, if you didn't catch it, although it is earlier on the podcast, you guys, it's right around the 300 episode mark. Um, but I was planning on a home birth and around 35 weeks, 35 weeks, Miss, Miss, um, Dr. Rash Jones, Miss Christine had to take me on, um, because I was, uh, preeclamptic at that point was struggling with some high blood pressure. I was getting into the preeclampsia zone. I wasn't quite there yet. We were watching it closely and I have a history of hemorrhage and there was some weird stuff coming up in my blood. It was not fun. And I'm not going to go into those details now, but I do want to just say before we ask you some questions that my listeners and my Instagram people have given us today. So stay tuned because we, ha we have questions for Dr. Jones, Dr. Brass Jones, um, from you guys. But I just wanted to say, I thought that I felt so natural. I don't know. I was so nervous to go see an OB at 35 weeks and some change and have some complications. And you were just like, let's go. You were like game time. It was not an issue. You were not nervous. You were just like, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to set you an induction date, but we're going to be generous with it. And then we're going to watch you. And you know, it was just like, you just took the lead. I loved it. You did great. Well, I try to take the lead 
in a certain way though, right? I mean, I want you to, uh, we're all partners in this, right? I shouldn't, yeah. if we're getting into complications, we shouldn't just, we shouldn't just not explain like, hey, we need to explain, hey, this is where we're at. This is where we need to be. And until we get there, we need to watch out for these things. Yeah. I mean, right? I can get into that science if people want it, or I can get into the, you know, all the risks. Some people do want that. Some people are like, whatever, just do a C-section. That's okay too, or whatever. Yeah. But, but in a lot of ways, it's helpful for somebody to understand why we're doing this. We don't just, excuse my English, make this shit up. We don't. Right. right. There's a lot of fun, tons of case studies. And, you know, if we do it this way, how will that work out? And research, research, research into why we do things the way we do them. Yeah. We don't just do them because we feel like it, you know what I mean? And we also want the best possible outcome for the patient and for their baby, because we always have two patients to deal with, you know, to not deal with, but to be taken care of. We can't exclude either one of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt yeah. that. I felt that. Well, okay. There was one more thing I wanted you to share, which was you said you had you said you had some spidey senses that popped up the morning that I had my C-section before, yeah. before I called you. Will you tell us about that part of you? Because I think it's going to so bring a trust to all those can, there, are, there are times when I have, I don't know, just a little intuitional tap on the shoulder. Yeah. Maybe, maybe one of my midwives is delivering a baby and I go, hey, how's it going? And they'll be like, oh, the baby just delivered. Everything's fine. Or mm -hmm. I'll be like, hey, you know, have you checked her in a while? Because it seems to be like a bit. And out of nowhere, I'll just do that. But in my mind, I'm thinking, this patient should be complete. She should have made some changes. Something should be happening. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, she just turned complete. And we, you know, or, you know, sometimes I'll feel like, oh, I don't know about this patient. She might be getting a little sick, thinking that maybe at this particular time, you know, we should start. I don't know, looking at them more closely, following labs or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't work all the time. I wish it did because then I'd be a lottery winner, you know what I mean? <laughs> but for my patients, it's helpful to just listen to those instincts, right? Yeah. Moms have instincts. Doctors have instincts. We need to listen to them to be able to take care of our patients. Yeah. You said you were walking your dog and you were like, she needs to have that baby. Like she needs to yeah, have Yeah, that's what I said. I was walking the dog. I was talking to Robin, maybe. Is that and one of your I said, I said, yeah, I said, she needs to have this baby like sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, it was sooner because <laughs> it was that day or the next day or something. Yeah. That was crazy cool. All right. So let's get into some of these questions, my loves, all the mamas that are listening. Well, okay. I want to kind of start with my questions, which is if you could pick one thing that insurance could give to moms that is not currently just given to moms, like moms either have to pay for it privately or whatever that maybe the community offers it, what would it be? Like if, if postpartum women I'm thinking and, or pregnant, and maybe you can answer each like pregnant and then postpartum. Yeah. If I could hand pick, I think it would be like, way better breastfeeding support and then also maybe just feed the babies like just you know if if they need um formula why are we not just at least supplement like formula is so expensive you know if you need formula then here's a voucher you you know it's kind of like they started doing the breast pumps and actually having insurance companies pay for it for it yeah. well that's lovely but what if i'm not going to breastfeed? What if I can't breastfeed? Why don't we also supplement my, you know, formula, whatever? Dang, because formula is expensive. And especially uh, my baby has a sensitive tummy and I've had to try like three different kinds, which wastes a couple different bottles because they were hurting her tummy. And then, yeah. And then it's not like perfect or whatever. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It is dang expensive. That's a cool one. Like giving vouchers for the cost of formula and then and, you know, when it comes to breastfeeding education, it was only until this fourth one that I realized how much I didn't know back when I was breastfeeding. And I got away with it because I had a decent milk supply and my babies weren't too 
in too bad of a condition, but I could have had really big problems. And if I had had really big problems, I don't know that I would have been equipped to handle them. So yeah, breastfeeding, there's, there's actually like a lot to it. It's, it's like a whole art. I know. And because they have all these initiatives and they want everybody to be like hundred percent breastfeeding, like in the hospitals and stuff and Jayco and all these different things. And it's like, well, then you have to give the people the support that they need. Right. If you want that outcome. Yeah. Well, and I bottle fed this time out of, out of necessity. I made like a mental health call a couple weeks after having baby because I was exclusively pumping. She was too small to get on my nipple and really actually feed. And, um, I just was like, I am not doing this. And I actually love bottle feeding too. And there's so many amazing good formulas that make me feel so good about, you know, what she's getting and stuff. So I I'm kind of more, I love breastfeeding. I always will. It's so intimate and delicious, but I'm also like, Oh, I don't, I think I might've done better postpartum with my adjustment if I hadn't have tried, like worried so much about breastfeeding and just like, I don't know. There was something, I felt like I was a bad mom if I didn't nail it. So that was kind of crazy. <laughs> Do you see moms like that, that are like all their panties are in a bundle over breastfeeding and it like kind of messes with them mentally? Totally. Absolutely. What do you Absolutely. Wanna, what do you want to say to them? If there's a mom <laughs> that is like, um, yes. So, so I think it has to be a balance. And if it's going to make you totally crazy, then you need to, to either like do some combo or just not breastfeed your baby. Okay, so I'll tell you, I am not a breastfed baby. When my mom had me, she was told, here, take this shot. And then here's formula. And then go home and give this baby the formula. Mm-hmm. Because they didn't even give me an option. They didn't give me an option. They just told me to formula feed my baby. And I went to medical school. So, you know. So. <laughs> it's not that bad. It can't be that big. <gasps> yes. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to see your face. It was perfect. And, you know, I went to medical school. I mean, I went to medical school and I was not a breastfed baby. So, like, you know, and I wasn't sick all the time. And, I mean, my sister and I had some stuff when we were little, but it's not like we were sick all the time or anything. My sister went to law school. I went to medical school. And, you know. Your life was pretty great. Yeah. I don't remember if it was one of your midwives or who, but they were like, listen, if I look at two humans and one was breastfed for two years and one was bottle fed from day one, I can't see a difference ever. No. (laughs) Like just keep it in perspective. So if you want to do it for reasons that you love, great. But if it is so hard for you, you're struggling and you feel like your mental health is on, on the cusp of breaking down over breastfeeding. There you have it. She was, she was bottle fed completely and she went to medical school. (laughs) Yeah. It's okay. Um, it's fine. Okay. And my mother did it not bond with me. You know what I mean? The other thing is my mom did it not bond with me. You were she fine. probably had a lot more bottles to wash and sterilize and things like that. Yeah. You know, I think it really gets complicated when people can't just breastfeed because I just breastfed pretty much. I would pump when I was at work, but... I think it starts to get crazy when you're maybe your supply is low and so you're breastfeeding and then you're pumping and then you're bottle feeding and then you're you know what I mean all that yeah. stuff I think I that's when it starts to get too com- too complicated and then you know you have to like make a decision you know what I mean if you've done everything to get your supply up but it's not working then maybe supplement and then eventually your breast milk will probably go away and then you formula feed your baby. And I mean, even the technology of the formula they have now versus when I was born, I'm sure is way more nutritious than ever. And so I wouldn't worry so much. Right. And your Thank job you. to bond is when your baby's in your belly. So when people say, well, I have to bond my baby, I got to have them on my chest for the whatever. I'm like, you didn't, I mean, I used to talk to my kid all day long, all day long. I talked to them. I'd be like, okay, get off my bladder. I'd be like, you know, I'd be like, Hey kid, are you hungry? Let's go eat something. You know, like we're bonding that, you know, they're inside of me and I'm, that's when we're bonding. Yeah. That's like a really good point. I, I don't want anyone to think that you have to breastfeed to be well bonded with your baby. And in fact, sometimes the stress of breastfeeding and even the caloric stress on your body, and I'm not anti-breastfeeding at all, but I'm just saying balance. It's balance. 
balance. balance. Yeah. It's a balance. Right. Let's talk about sleep. <laughs> sleep is no sleep. Is, I mean, I haven't slept in years. So <laughs> sleep is super important. Tell me, tell me why you know that. Oh, okay. Are you wanting me to talk about how I broke down in your office now? Is that what you're hinting at? <laughs> we, yeah. So, I mean, what happened for us? And I kind of mentioned this in our, uh, in my birth story stuff, or maybe the next ones after that. I don't know. But um, our baby was early. I had a, my placenta partially ruptured. So she came 36 and six and I had an emergency C-section. I'd never recovered from a C-section before because I had all my babies vaginally. And then she had, we didn't know it at the time, but she had like a tight upper lip and also a a restricted tongue. So she had a lot of tenseness in her face and her swallowing and eating wasn't great. So she was swallowing a lot of bubbles. So she was really gassy and uncomfortable. So she was sleeping like four hours during the nighttime. It was insane. And I had always just been with my babies throughout the night. I'd never hired any sleep support before. Granted, I did have all the rest of my kids in my 20s and now I'm 33. (laughs) But yeah, I went into Dr. B's office and I was like, uh, I don't even know what I said. I just started crying, I think, in the middle of my sentence. And well, she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She just looked at me. She's like, what? what's going, you're different than last time. Like what's going on? I was like, well, she's sleeping about four hours a night. And she, <laughs> yeah. And that's, I think when I started crying and, and I was getting really anxious too, because I had, um, you were like looking at you, you had me do it a quick ultrasound because of stuff that was, we were figuring details out anyway. What happened was you, you weren't sleeping. And so you kind of forgot to take care of yourself. Like at all. That's true. That's true. That's kind of like just put yourself on the back burner and now you were you didn't even realize that you were suffering because you put your needs so far back you know what I mean so far back that you couldn't even almost like catch up to that oh my gosh so beautifully said it's true it's absolutely true. The sleep deprivation, and you know, my mindset was I've got to get the baby what she needs. And I was hanging on and hanging on and I was putting myself last so that I could get her what she needed. And you were like, yeah, but you can't do that. You can't do that. You need to. Well, but the other thing is have other people to help you with the baby. You just don't want to like let that happen sometimes, right? So you got to let other people help you with the baby. The baby doesn't care, right? You got who doesn't care who's holding and loving on it and stuff like that while you're sleeping, you know, like there's, you you can give the baby to your mom or your, or your dad or to your husband or to your sister or whatever. And then you got to take a little time for your own self care. Yeah. Yeah. And you made fun of me (laughs) in the nicest way possible. (laughs) Cause you're like, we were just joking about how we're a post, I'm a postpartum coach and, <laughs> and I was, I was having my moment postpartum. Um, and then you told me stories of how, you know, everything about pregnancy and yet you were pregnant as a practicing OB and kind of didn't do everything you were telling your pregnant moms to do. And you're like, yeah, it happens. Right. It happens. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody makes mistakes, but yeah. we have to then like, at least what you did that day was you listened to me and then you went home and you kind of implemented. I took action. Oh, I did. started to feel better. You started Mm -hmm. to feel better. Yeah. And I think that came from my deep trust of you. And I'm trying to think of what, I think there was a lot of trust in that moment when I was first in your office and you stopped talking. You were like, you tell me what's going on. And that, that built a lot of trust. And then you were just so fun and you weren't like, I don't know. You know that whole idea of the white jacket syndrome where people just get white anxious. Coat. White coat. Thank you. White coat. You don't wear white coats in my office for that reason. Because a lot of times I'll have a student, usually have a PA student come in and they'll walk in with their white coats and I'll be like, yeah, leave that in your car next time. <laughs> Nobody really wants to see that. That's not right. what we're we're not like we're wearing our white coats because we're better than you, you know. But I guess <laughs> There's like a symbol, there's a symbolization of like, you know, that you're the physician or the physician's assistant when you wear a certain white coat, but it's a different dynamic when you're working with uh, moms and, you know, pregnant women or menopausal or, you know, teenagers, you just, it's a different, it's a different 
yeah kind of relationship kind of you have to have there, so yeah speaking of that relationship do you ever sense that your patients aren't wanting to tell you everything and they're kind of nervous to talk to you so personally not usually because somehow I get them to start talking about whatever it is you know yeah and I don't know so not usually do I have that personal problem good well I was I was just curious because I feel like um I withheld a lot in my when I was in my 20s having my first couple babies and I think I just didn't feel a lot of trust with my provider but I also didn't think I don't know. I just didn't know what I could have in a provider until I found you. I didn't realize how natural and how easy and how comfortable a relationship with an OB could feel. And so I was really um, kind of not interested in having an OB. This is one of the main reasons why I, my, my one experience with the OB that I had was just not awesome. And so I'm like, thank you for healing my, my perception of OBs, Dr. Brown. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. And I love that you surround yourself with midwives. You have your five, I think five midwives, right? That practice cert- certified yeah. midwives. So they're in the yeah. hospital. They're, they're essentially doing everything unless it gets emergent. I mean, so I actually, yeah. I wasn't even going to see Dr. Brass in the hospital um, unless there was some sort of problem. That was our plan. Like she might not have even seen me but then my placenta ruptured and I needed a C-section. So of course she was the one to do that. But um, yeah, let's talk about, you told me at one point in my care, cause I was really nervous about hemorrhaging again, remember? Cause I had a history with hemorrhaging. And one thing you said to me that was really calming that I, I kind of want other moms to hear is you said about nine years ago when I had my hemorrhage, there's, you said there's a lot more now in the past nine years. Yeah that we can do than we could have done nine years ago. Can you tell us without getting too gory, I guess, (laughs) for the mamas that, you know, might not love the blood and guts stuff. Can you tell us, um, what, like, what, what can you do for blood control and bleeding control and stuff like that? So the, probably the two biggest, uh, things that have made a difference is one of them is called TXA or try anaxemic acid i can't it's hard to pronounce but it's called txa yeah. that medication was developed to help your body make uh, more blood clots so that you can stop bleed okay. so that has been a game changer and has actually moved up to like the front line of most of the time when you start having a hemorrhage you okay. immediately start with the TXA. It's like first line. TXA. And usually we're doing Pitocin to try to get your uterus to clamp down. And we have methogen, which helps decrease the blood flow. But that's only if your blood pressure is okay. But the TXA doesn't really have any of these other. It's just like, hey, start clotting better. Mm-hmm. Body. Cool. So that's really helpful. And then the other thing that we have, we have a new device that was actually developed by some researchers were having a competition at MIT no way. and it's like a new uh, device that goes into the uterus and it like suctions down so that the uterus that might be bleeding gets kind of sucked down with some um, suction in internal suction and then it kind of helps the uterus to slow down its bleeding while you are getting the uterus to try to clamp down on it. Wow. And we have this other one that was like a balloon that goes inside, but this new one, it's called the Jada, is even better. than So the Bakri balloon or the Jada, those are all kind of newer things too. And the TXA is probably the biggest. Dang. So we have like, you know, more tools in our toolbox to help you. Sometimes we even have to get like interventional radiology in, you know, in to intervene if somebody's like really bleeding. But but we have like more tools in our toolbox to help moms keep their uteruses because back in the day, the you know the last resort, I guess, still the last resort might be hysterectomy. Yeah, but we have less and less time that we actually have to go there. Yeah, so, awesome. Yes, that is last resort would be a hysterectomy. I agree. Um, what do you see is working? I mean, 
I know your, your focus is not postpartum, obviously. I mean, you, you do the best you can caring for that, but, um, and you, you, you medic, you can help women get medicated if they want to get medicated, but what do you see that's working well, whether it's something within your practice or other providers of some kind for postpartum women? Like, I don't know. Are, are they telling you like, oh, I tried this and it's really helping or for their mental health? I think placenta encapsulation is helpful. It seems like more and more people are utilizing it and it's really helping them after they have a baby. So a lot of users will do placenta encapsulation. They take your placenta home, they dehydrate it, right. they grind it up into like a powder and then they put it in capsules. Right. Probably has something to do with the high progesterone that we hang out with during our pregnancy. And then when our placenta leaves, we like plummet. You know, we plummet to the earth, you know, with our yeah. progesterone levels in our body. And then yeah. so by ingesting placenta afterwards, we can keep our progesterone a little more even keeled as we kind of naturally go down, right? Yeah. Like you, take, you don't take the placenta encapsulation or the encapsulated placenta all the time, but you just kind of slowly go down and, you know, use it. I think another thing that helps is there's a lot of people who are getting more and more instruction in how to utilize medications that maybe other, you know, otherwise weren't being used during pregnancy and postpartum that they're safe, they're whatever. So people who have problems with mental health or have been on a medication for forever, we don't have to throw, take them off of it a lot of times and we can keep them on it safely. And then they can breastfeed on it. So we just learning more and more things about that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm not a doctor, but I'm I'm personally not afraid of being on an antidepressant while pregnant or nursing. It didn't bother me or my baby, as far as I can tell. And um, it was very helpful to me for my benefit. So yeah, she's she's nodding her head. That's what we'll say about that. Yeah. It's kind of three o'clock and I don't want to keep you too long, but I just want to say thank you so much. There's probably even more questions we could ask you, but I, I think my, my main reason I wanted to bring you on is I wanted to just show women that like, keep, keep looking. If you don't feel awesome about your provider, like I feel awesome. I feel so awesome and so taken care of and so seen and so calm and chill. I mean, I always get a little anxious when I go into any sort of doctor type office, but Dr. Brass and her team are just incredible. And I'm like, keep searching until you find someone that you feel like that with. That's what I want to say, because it is so important. The relationship with you have, you have with the provider. I, I, I serve so many women who go to their six week checkup and they won't tell their provider what's really going on in their mind and, and body because they're, they're too scared. They don't feel safe. So I think Dr. Brash, you do an awesome job at helping your people feel safe. And I would just say to the mamas, like, find someone that you can feel safe with. It's so, so, so important. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. It's also important when you go to your pediatrician too. Because I remember I had a pediatrician picked out, but then I liked the guy who came in when I had my first. So I tried his office first and I hated his staff. And I was like, nope, we're never coming back here again. They handled my baby like some kind of, I don't know, McDonald's hamburger. And I could say that because I used to work at McDonald's. <laughs> and not like my precious newborn that I just, you know, Risk my grew and birth and, you know. So I think it's important to not settle. It's important not to settle. Don't settle. Don't. Find, your, find your human. Find your human. Find your human. They're out there and you can. They're out there. Don't just, you know, like some people pick, you know, places that have like a hundred locations and tons of whatever, but that doesn't mean you're going to get the best care. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Right. And I, I, one of the things that really drew me and I'll, we're wrapping up. I just wanted to say one, one thing that really drew me to you and your office and everything, your practice was your your focus on natural stuff. Like you have massages that you have massage therapists that I can book with. It's through your website and you have certified nurse midwives that do the rounds in the hospital. And then you have the more invasive stuff for the emergencies that do occur occasionally. Um, but you guys have like herbal tea in the waiting room and it's like homemade and you have like crystals in there and it's a freaking OB's office. I love it. <laughs> You're the well, best. 
thank you. We loved you. We loved having you too. We still love you and your little one. And your husband is just a freaking hysterical man. I know. So he, he was he was very entertaining at all times. <laughs> He was. And he took me at ease so good. By the way, he told me to tell you hi when I told him that I was interviewing you. And let's, you know, we can always do this again so we can answer more of those questions or you can send me the question. I can look at them beforehand and, yeah. you know, whatever you want is fine. You're the best. Well, thank you. Okay, hey, we'll we'll probably definitely have you back on. That's That sounds like a deal. We love you. And yeah. uh, you guys, if you have any questions, if you live in the area, please do reach out to her office. I'll put the link in the show notes of this episode so you can check out the Center for True Harmony and Wellness um, and any of her staff. And they're all awesome. So thanks again, Dr. B. Have a great day. Mwah. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> hey, Lizzie here. I've helped dozens of postpartum moms just like you to manage their postpartum anxiety and deconstruct their postpartum depression. It's really easy for me. So if you're ready to feel better, I know the way. Let's chat on the phone. Set up a time by going to lizzylangston.com forward slash consult. It's pretty simple and I will be calling you soon.